Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Spirit Lake, Iowa with the Matuska Tax Survey Supply Company. Brett Wingfield and Tom Matuska here again with you. And uh, boy, is it windy today. Oh, my goodness. Yesterday, today, and I think the rest of the week, too. I saw a chicken. I saw a chicken walking up the road. Chicken. Laid the same egg three times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's pretty windy, windy here. I heard um, just basic 30 mile an hour winds and uh, um, it was gusting even to 50 and some people said 60 miles an hour. So uh, yes. the lake is all churned up and, and the fish are at the bottom and <laughs> mouths are closed. I'm I hoping think. not to get blown across the lake. Or if you want a little walleye chop, we got it. <laughs> yeah. But you're gonna need a yeah. bigger boat than most of us have. I think North Dakota's got a foot of snow or more. Have you seen that? No, but I saw you look yes. out the window twice today and said it's snowing out. <laughs> yeah, it did. Everybody said it did. stop that not negativity. Like Oh, that's funny. Uh, well, if you joined us uh, for the last, um, have we done this three times? Four. Four times. Four? We're on number oh. five. Number five, I'm sorry, we're on We're on four. four. Um, but if you joined us for the three previous weeks, uh, we're showing you how to tan. And this all came about because we have so many so questions do. people call in about tanning. They want to learn how to tan or they're having trouble with their tan. And tanning is a very serious, serious issue. Um, you can't afford mistakes when you're tanning. It's yep. bad enough if you make a mistake tanning your own, um, but what if you're working on a customer's? You gotta be extremely responsible. And um, we can show you how to do absolutely everything right, and there's some people that just aren't responsible. They, they don't watch their pH, or they don't watch the temperature of their water. Um, there's a thousand different things that can go wrong, and everything we're trying to show you, follow that regiment, and you should have very successful results tanning. Um, you've said a lot of times it's like baking, like baking. It a is cake. like baking. You yeah. know, if you if you make a coat, a, a cake, the worst thing that happens if you mess it up or don't read the recipe right is it tastes bad or it falls flat or doesn't isn't moist or doesn't stay together. Um, you don't read the recipe with a hide. It's a lot the same, but way more serious. Worse, yeah. So it is yeah. kind of like baking. Follow a regimen. I would suggest that you get yourself a tanning notebook, especially if you're new to tanning, um, and write everything down, yeah. because if something went wrong, you can look back and you've documented absolutely everything, and you can call us and ask us, here's what I did. Dun, 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 dun. I tried to, um, anytime one of you will call and say, you know, I'm having trouble with stretch, or I'm having trouble with, you know, slippage or um, whatever it happens to be, I usually have you describe your system to me and yeah. oftentimes we can find, you know, the fly in the ointment by what you tell us that you're, you're doing. So um, a lot can go wrong in tanning, but if you come up with the right system and the right chemicals and everything's working and you do repeat that process over and over, um, tanning is not difficult. Tanning yeah. is um, pretty uh, satisfying when you get it done. It's kind of yeah. gratifying and you think, wow, I did that. You got lots of stretch and your hair is luscious and beautiful. Um, you can turn out some really, really nice products yeah. tanning. And it is labor intensive, especially when you start out. Um, you're working with little bitty scalpels, you're working with knives, and it's kind of like sitting down at this table for a whole day and yeah, you can spend absolutely. a whole day very easy on this yeah. until you get re until you get practiced up. Once you get practiced up and you learn how to sharpen your knives real good, everything starts going better. You learn which tools work best for you. Um, you work. You learn how to sharpen your machine. All of those and tanning will continually, continually get easier and easier for you, and you'll get faster. Yeah. Um, but it is starting out. It's a kind of a slow process, and it has to be done. Um, right and thoroughly. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, one thing we're gonna we're gonna show you. I think if you think back, we um, showed you how to take a cape and how to turn the ears inside out. We put a little salt in there so the inside of this cartilage got salted. That's very very important. Uh, that salt just turns to salt slush and it, it's run out by now. But it did its job setting the hair on the inside of the ear. That's important and that's something that I learned the hard way in my early career. Um, 
then we showed you how to split the lips and that was a matter of butterflying over these papillae and that really thick skin was like this and we cut it from the back side and we flipped it over and now salt can get in there. So we did that. We cut between the septum on each side of the septum, took the septum out and lifted up these nasal passages, we call them wings, lift up the little wings um, and their cartilage and we lifted them up so salt can get underneath there. So that was another real important thing. Then um, if you have a machine, for sure, if you're going to tan your own hides, you're going to need a machine of yes. some sort. Um, we showed you the um, American Eagle flushing machine, and we'll have that out again in the future here because we're going to flush this hide, these hides really, really thoroughly. And yeah. you can't get an even job. The minute I say you can't, somebody's going to show me their hide, and it'll be beautiful. But it's very difficult to get a real even flush job with nice, thin, uniform skin without a flushing machine. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to weigh the, weigh the odds. Um, when you start out, if you're doing three or four deer heads a day, don't buy a $3,000 flushing machine. But all of a sudden you're gonna find yourself doing um, maybe 50 deer heads a year, and not a day, 50 <laughs> year, deer heads a, a year. And what does a tannery get now? I bet they're up to $60 I or bet more, right? so, it's been a while Plus since shipping. I look. Yep, both um, ways. So that's $3,000 yeah. right there. So with what you save and send it to the tannery, you could buy a good flushing machine yeah. and use it for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. um, our oldest flushing machines that we still use and like very much are um, oh, man. Quebec flushing machines are 40 years old and they look brand new and they flush like brand new. Yeah. Um, flushing machines, typically you might need a new bearing once in a while or you might need, you'll need blades from time to time or have your blades sharpened, but um, unless you're real hard on them, they'll last kind of forever. They're pretty trouble free. Really well. Yeah. New motor occasionally. Yeah. Um, so we had this all, all split. We call it, we call it prepping. And then we flushed it, you flushed it on the flushing machine for them. Mm -hmm. And That's if good. you don't have a flushing machine to start with, um, you can flush them on a beam with a yeah. draw knife and you can take off all of the um, fat and meat real well. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to get off is the fat and the meat. If you have a machine, it's much easier. And if you want to tan it, you're going to have to send it or flush it on a machine. Yeah. If you wanted to send to the tannery, you do not need a machine. Yep. They will do that for you. But yeah, that's what, that's what you pay them for. And to me, as much tanning as I've done, I say the secret to tanning is thin in the hide. Mm -hmm. um, if you do not thin this hide, and it's an 18 inch neck, for instance, you're not gonna get it on a 17 inch neck. Yeah. But if you thin it very, very thin, you're gonna get it to 18 and you're gonna have all kinds of nice taxi room, yeah. you know, um, able to taxi the skin where you need it. That's very important. So to start with, you're gonna take it out of the pickle and what we do is we, like our pickles are, we put it in a tub last week, mm -hmm. but a lot of times we'll, um, our, make our pickles in a 33 gallon garbage tote, just a garbage can, plastic one. Don't use metal unless it's stainless steel. And then um, you can probably start, we fleshed them when we have school, we start teaching students, we'll put them in there and leave them in for two, three, four hours. And you can start fleshing, but you're gonna run into things that look like it's raw yeah. and the pickle just hasn't got there yet. So. Um, usually a day and they're like this. Nice, nice and supple. If you let them dry out too much, you could have some dry spots here and there. Yep. And then this hide is just gonna get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And you're gonna work on a little area, finish that, go to the next little area, get tired of that, go to the next and little area. Around. We're gonna put it on the machine again. Um, and to show you, I'll sh I'm gonna start you out on eyes here. Here's what, a, can't find the eye, I want this one. Here's what an eye looks like. Remember you skinned it away from the head and you have all of that membrane that connects the kind of the eyelid to the kind of to the inside of the eye. Yeah, Kate's got a good picture now, yeah. So we're going to 
when, when you started, you took your scalpel and you split that, which lifted it up so salt can get in there. Now, what do you do with all this stuff? This is a lot. Here's what we're after. You did this one in preparation for this. And Brett's a pretty good flesher. Real good, <laughs> actually. Um, but look at this thin skin. Look how thin that skin is. How thin this is. This whole area here is thinned. That's, other than a little bit of touch up, this is about ready to mount this area right here. You're gonna do the same to this one and I'm gonna show you in a minute. And then we're gonna flesh. Now, now some people are really good with the fleshing machine and they'll be able to flesh. I mean, I have seen people hold that little bitty eye skin <laughs> and flesh it on the machine. <laughs> Um, I don't want to do that. I'm, That's, that I would have thumbs. customers with yeah. two big eyes on their deer cake. <laughs> I wouldn't have an eyeball big enough to put in there. Um, too big a hole. But anyway, so we like, I like to um, do the knife work around here and spread it out a little way so that my machine yeah. can get all the flat, nice, thick, flat stuff. Now, something you'll find um, when you start learning how to tan and how to flesh, something you're going to learn is trouble areas that you have on your, when you're mounting, oftentimes is because of what you're doing right now. Yeah. Um, some of you are gonna have deer eyes. Anybody, I mean, I'm gonna hit a, hit a chord with somebody where I say, um, where I say, you know, do your ear eye, deer eyes pull away from the deer? There's a good chance that you might want could, to show them that case. could be your form is much too um, big and you're stretching, that's one thing. The other thing is if this is not thinned, I mean like really thinned around that eye, that eye is gonna pull and draw away from the glass and you're gonna have a yeah. gaping gap that you have to repair. How many of you have um, a big gap or every time your deer dry, you leave them to dry and a week later you come mm -hmm. back and all of a sudden you got a white bone showing around the antler burr. Um, I'll bet you for two years I had extra capes to patch because I always had antler bone. It took me a long time to figure out, I wasn't very smart, it took me a long time to figure out that it was because I'm not getting this skin around here thin enough. You get it really, really thin and thin skin does not have the power to draw away as much. Um, sometimes lips, any of you have your lips pull out, same thing. All that lip skin has to be very, very thinned and you correlate your lip slot that you cut with your thin skin. You want it firm to tuck, but you don't want to force it in real hard, but you don't want it loose so it falls yeah. back out. Um, I'm sure some of you can relate to some of the things I'm saying. How many of you sewing up the back of your deer have really sore fingers from pushing that needle through? You know, just it's really yeah. hard or you got to use the pliers. When we sew up a deer, um, we could use a round needle with our bare fingers and not have to force it through because our skin on the back of that deer is very, very thin. Thin skin will not draw away and show your seam and show your stitches. So as you learn how to tan and how to flesh very well, um, mounting is gonna get exceptionally, exceptionally nicer and easier. Um, I had a, started teaching the taxidermy school and. I thought I could sharpen a knife pretty well and had run a meat market and locker plant, you know, and cut meat for a living for a couple of years. Um, I had a couple of fellows from John Morrell who came and uh, as students and really taught me how to sharpen a knife. And the day that I learned how to sharpen a knife, my taxidermy work went up yeah. tenfold. You know, it's unbelievable. So a sharp knife is really, really important. Okay, so in order to make this look like this, I'll show you what I would do. The first thing I like to do is I don't need all of this. I want to tuck. How much do you like to tuck? Not a lot. A quarter, quarter. at the most, eighth to a quarter. Quarter inch. So I've got at least probably, oh man two and a quarter inches here. So I'm gonna trim it back. I just got a good scissors. You can use a scalpel or you can use anything that you want um, that you can cut nice with. Don't cut any eyelashes. 
and I'm just going to start cutting some of this skin that I've already split back. And I'm not going to cut it quite back to a quarter yet, but I will when I mount it. Nice to get rid of that excess first so it's, you're not fleshing a whole bunch of extra. It's not so overwhelming with yeah. what do we do with all this stuff. Yeah. I'm just kind of minimizing some of the work that I have to do. Okay, now I have a real nice little apron of skin. And that looks way better than what I had before. So now the first thing you want to do is make sure with a scalpel or a knife, whichever you're comfortable with, um, if you can get your knives really, really, really sharp, um, a knife is great. I like using a knife. It's a little bit more forgiving than a number 11 scalpel blade, but we do use number 11 scalpel blades quite a bit. Um, they can just cut faster than you want them to sometimes. So I'm going to put my finger under here, and if you use your fingers as a gauge, you'll soon know if you went too deep. Gets a little red. Um, and on this one, whoever split this, I think you might have done this, um, whoever split this eye, split down into the fatty, um, glandular material in the eyelid. And if you're down that far, um, you're getting really close to the edge. You'll also see, um, I don't know, Caitlin, if you can get really close and see it, you'll also see little um, um, roots from the eyelashes. And when you see the eyelash roots, just kind of score between them. And then I take my thumb and forefinger, and this is my calipers. And I'm going to put my thumb and my forefinger there, and I'm going to rub them back together, and I'm going to try to feel for flatness. If I feel a cord in there, I know that I want to split farther so I don't have a cord. I'm going to go all the way around the entire eye, feeling for a little cord. That's a Honda, right? A cord. Mm -hmm. White tail of cord. <laughs> Now I can see uh, eyelash roots. I see a little darkness here of eyelash roots. Oh, Kate's got a good view now. Don't now, move. If you cut a hole, if you cut a hole, we always, when we're teaching people, these number 11s are very, very pointy. Don't use them in a slicing motion because if you cut a hole, it's going to be a half inch long hole. But if you do it, use it in a scratching motion, if you cut a hole, it good chance it's not even going to have to be repaired. Okay, and I just keep feeling for flatness all the way around. Once I think I'm pretty flat, now I want to start fleshing, and I have to flesh two things. I have to flesh this apron, this little bitty apron, and I have to flesh all of this meat around here to where I can get to it from the machine. So let's try that first. And I, I like to put it on a bat. Fine, you'll come up with your your own favorite um, tools to do this with. And you're gonna want a sharp knife or scalpel or whatever works for you. Not that one. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Maybe. That's better. Now you should be, hold your knife very flat and you should be able to flesh really nice with it. Now there's all kinds of different tools you can have, and we're going to show you a few of them, and then, then uh, you're just going to have to practice with them and decide what works the best for you. And we, I always like to have a fine steel handy to sharpen my knife. They can go back and look at some of our previous videos. I think you did a really nice video on sharpening nice knives. Nice sharpening we yeah, did. Yeah, that's a good one. If you haven't seen that one, um, that's the one where Facebook, we have the old, old chart from General yeah. Motors, uh, one of the yeah, I think that electric, was General Electric companies or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but that's a good one. If you haven't seen that, our Facebook and YouTube library has. Uh, 
all now, of our previous videos in it. You can get in a motion after you get a sharp knife and it's working good, get in a little motion and all of a sudden you can see how good this is fleshing. And these are all, these are all whisker roots. You're gonna find on any animal that you flesh, if you cut a whisker root, it's gonna fall out. And if you look at a deer, a fresh deer or a live deer, you're gonna see that he has hundreds and hundreds of whiskers on his face and he uses those to sense everything you know whether he's eating or smelling or you know those or whatever it happens to be those whiskers are in action at all times and you don't we want to flesh this really good but we don't want to lose all the whiskers so if possible i see a whisker root coming up i may just get in the habit of going around it. Now, if you start fleshing around every single whisker, this is going to take you till 2040 <laughs> to be able to, you know, call this thing done. But um, if you just watch some of them, you're going to still have so many whiskers that nobody would ever know. So I, I'm going to go around the entire eye like this and I'll feel, for, again, here's my calipers. My fingers are my calipers and I want to feel nice thin leather. I don't want to see hair roots. If I feel or see hair roots coming through, those hair, if you cut the roots, they're going to fall out. So keep that to a minimum. The next thing I'm going to do is this little bitty apron, and that's going to be our tucking skin when we mount this deer. And if I have a bat here, Now when you take these hides out of the pickle, make sure that you drain them because you'll have pickle juice running all over. Okay, I stretch it onto a bat. And you can stretch it on there nice and tight. You shouldn't hurt the eye, I suppose you could. Um, then I'm gonna take, you know, sharp instrument, whichever is your choice, knife, scalpel, whatever it happens to be. And I'm gonna hold it very flat because this skin is already extremely thin and I'm gonna to try to thin it even more. We do have a question from Robbie Kusner, and Robbie is wondering, so he's switching from dry preservatives to wet tanning this year. He was taught by an old taxidermist to pickle hides in a denatured alcohol salt water solution. Her mounts always last and have no slippage and get tremendous stretch after being run on the fleshing machine ever heard of that any cons other than the skin not plumping up as much compared to an acid pickle um i think that would be all oh, that's a little bit very similar to what we do for squirrels um, sure. is uh denatured alcohol denatured alcohol will set your hair quite well um it's not a bad thing it does uh dry them up a little bit and make make them a little tougher to work with in my mind in my estimation compared to a pickle makes them just a little harder to work with but yes i've heard that heard of that okay now i just keep going round 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 now remember if you make a hole in this apron you're going to be it's kind of interesting because i i refer to the taxidermy school when we teach students this we always have about the third week um three days of terrible depression where people are cutting so many holes that they're sick to their stomach. Remember? Oh yeah. And, oh uh, yeah. But uh, a lot of the holes that they're cutting are so minuscule, although it's one after another after another. And yes, some of them are going to have to be um, fixed, but on this eye skin, it gets tucked up into see in the clay and nobody's going to see it. Don't even have to fix it. Okay, this is kind of pretty thin. I like what I got here. I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm gonna just trim that off. And just leave yourself a nice, even apron. And this is probably no thicker than a thin piece of paper. It's pretty thin yeah. right there. Now I haven't gone all the way around or we'll run out of time here, but so you're gonna thin your lid all the way around. You're gonna thin your skin 
to where the flushing machine can reach. Um, one more thing I want to mention is in the front corner of the eye between your tear duct and your eye orbit is a tendon and you can see a little white, see that little white strip right there. Um, you will want to shave that down. I'll point to it right there. This is the front of the eye. Here's the eye. Here's his tear duct. And it's this little white cord. And we want to flesh that off all the way down to the skin and keep feeling. Remember, use your fingers like a little gauge. And uh, that skin, that tendon will shrink and cause your eye and your tear duct to distort. So get that cord fleshed, get all of this fleshed all the way around um, and your eye will be done. Yeah. Got to do it two times. And now this is um, everything that we did prior um, the hide could have gone to the tannery. Could have, You yeah. may still, when you get it back from the tannery, you may still be doing this um, same process. Um, we're doing it in a pickled state, so it's safe. You can spend hours, days doing this if you need to. Um, on the tanned cape, um, back from the tannery, it you start losing time again. So this is, we choose to do it in a pickle, like you're doing here. Um, and, it, and it's much safer, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You can um, remember we were talking about the meter was running when, when we were working on this, prepping all this stuff, you know. And yeah. like you say, um, you got to get the salt to it. You got to take away the environments for bacteria growth. Once it goes into the pickle, it can lay out here. Um, you could be a little care, and you don't want to be careless, but you could. You could forget it on the table the next day. It's going to probably be fine. Uh, you could leave it in the pickle too long. Not seven years, but you could <laughs> and probably be fine. Sure. And uh, so you can get tired of working on this, go to the kids, little kids ball game, you know, go to the mm -hmm. t-ball game and throw him back in the pickle and come back, work on him the next morning and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yep. Okay. Got um, yeah, go Hannah Sega, who is wondering if the cape is damp from the pickle, is the acid harmful to work with? No. Well, maybe. <laughs> Heard uh, if you get it in little cuts. Yeah, it's it's... I think the salt is more burning yeah. than anything else. Yeah. And the salt burns, um, um, dries out your hands. Your yeah. hands will get, if you do this every day, day in and day out, your hands will get real chapped. You want to use lotion. Yeah. Um, this salt or this acid in the pickle has been diluted enough to have the pH of vinegar. Yeah. So vinegar, um, people drink vinegar. I mean, vinegar is not harmful. Um, the acid has been diluted enough. You put... Um, 10 ounces in, Ten, what, yeah. or, I'm thir let's see, 13 yeah. for 20 gallons, so yeah. 7 ounces for 10 gallons, and that's a lot diluted, yeah. and it's pretty harmless. Yeah. Um, some people will get itchy, you know, sure. get in the habit of wearing rubber gloves, it's, it's basically harmless. Yeah. Um, should I show them a Skype knife? Yeah. There's, there's lots of different tools we're going to show you. Brett's got a um, couple over here, and we got to get all of this off. This is one method. The machine, for me, doesn't get up here far. I'm too chicken no. to get up too far with the machine. I can do the knife. I can do the knife for the whole way. That works good. Another tool, and it, I don't know if it'll work or not, is a Skype knife. The hide has to be the right dryness for a Skype knife to work. And a Skype knife is nothing more than a little piece of tin. Um, the good ones are made of stainless steel. Um, the ones that aren't so good rust and corrode terribly because you got salt and acid in here. Um, the uh, blade that goes in here, you just use these over and over and over, but you will need to replace a blade two, three times a day. And they're yeah. single edge razor blades. Um, you can buy them in 100 packs. They last, last quite a while. Um, the hide has to be kind of dry. If it's slippery wet, it will not work. And all this does for you is hold a sharp blade flat. That's kind of all it does. And when it works, it's the best thing ever. 
Yeah, I've seen people go around with a scythe knife and do amazing, amazing work. Can you get a really no close up of this? Because this is working pretty good now. Right in this spot right here. Good. I don't know if you can see, but look at how that blade just shaves that. And you're going to get in a, once you get a little confident, you're going to get a little motion like this. And don't bear down on it, or you can cut a hole. But I'm taking off, oh man, a 30 second of an inch of tissue. And you want to make sure that your hide's very flat underneath. And this is an inexpensive tool. And I think the first um, Skype knife I ever bought laid in my box for a couple years because I didn't have much faith in it. But and you have to clean it out of the blade there. Um, but um, once you get used to these, for me they're pretty darn helpful. Now I'm seeing a lot of whisker roots pop, not the roots pop up, but the little dark spots where the whiskers are. And if I keep going deeper, I'll hit them. But with the Skype knife, I can kind of maneuver around them a little bit and leave plenty of whiskers on there. And this, you wouldn't use this on the body of the, skin, of the hide, but you will use it areas that you can't get with the flushing machine. So that's pre getting pretty thin. You can go farther. Um, and when we check this, double check this and make sure that it's thin enough to tan, um, it's going to just, we're going to, fine-tune everything with a knife and a scythe knife and maybe some tools you're going to see. So I'm all the way down to the skin there. All the flesh and meat is gone, and it feels very, very thin. John Morley is wondering if you ever use a Dremel with a sanding drum. Oh, we're getting to that, Sean. <laughs> That's one of our tricks that you get to see. Yes, we do. Dremel can work pretty good. Yeah, it does. It really does. Um, the next thing, what would you like to demonstrate anything, here? Anything. We got a lot to, lot to do on do. that hide. And as you sit and work on these, um, you, like I keep saying, you get faster and faster and faster and it, it gets real satisfying. Um, so you went around a nostril a little bit on the side of the face. Somebody um, did. Um, might have to go oh, around the lip bit, line yeah. a little bit. Should I show them the lip line? This is where we did, um, we, we split our lips earlier. Um, they're not per not necessarily perfectly butterflied. So that's the first thing you want to do is check and make sure your lip line is completely split all the way. So it lays nice and flat and you can do that just with your fingers by testing all the way around. I feel a little thick spot here. I'm just going to touch that and lay that open a little bit more. Now, if, if that more. isn't butterfly all the way open and you cut a little too deep, you can have a couple holes on each side. Yeah. And your spot will never get laid out flat. You'll have two holes and still have to split. Um, so nice to run around and do that. Um, do all your splitting and double check that first. I mean, you like that little Dexter knife. I do. I do for some reason that, and the Chicago knife as well. They're just nice and flexible, um, easy to put an edge on. Um, I go through them a little bit. I sharpen them a lot, but um, as they get pointy down on the end, they start serving different purposes. Um, that's but, an inexpensive knife, um, and it's really a, really a good little workhorse. Boy, they are. They're a, I don't know that I'd want to do too much without it. It's one of those tools you look for a half an hour if you can't find it. Um, but we'll go all the way around here. I think that's pretty good. Um, the next thing, we'll come back to the front pad of the nose, which is here. There we go. You can see both nostril wings there. And now we have to flesh that surface nice and thin. And to do that, I just like a, a nice flat surface underneath to support it. And we'll stretch that out. This, this hide's been in the pickle a little bit longer and it's a little stiff. So I just like to make sure there's no wrinkles. If you cut through a wrinkle, um, you're going to get holes. So be very careful. We lay our knife nice and flat 
and just keep going. This would be another good spot for the uh, skife knife if, if you prefer that. And just like Tom mentioned, you'll see whisker bases in the, in the rhinarium here as well. They don't show up quite as dark, but they're still little whisker roots. So um, you'll go through those. Um, some of you may want to go around all of them. Um, too many of them there for us to spend too much time going around. But just going to keep thinning just like that. And you can see there's, there's a good eighth of an inch of, of tissue on that nose that we need to get removed. And you'll know that you're getting down to the surface that you're needing to um, because the color will start to change. Notice this little bit of blue hue starting to show through. And that's actually the, that's when you get really sad <laughs> when you're blue. blue. blue <laughs> um, that's the that is the the rhinarium or the surface of the nose starting to show through the dark um, black epidermis or shouldn't say black, but dark part of the epidermis showing through on the other side. So that's starting to show through. We know we're starting we're starting to get thin enough there. And like everything, um, the nose has a lot of detail when we do our finish work. If we get this nice and thin, um, our, fin our finish work will be minimal. We won't have a lot of movement or cracks or things like that to deal with. Um, if you don't get this nice and thin, um, the surface of the nose can be kind of troublesome for some people. Re Bill, Whoops, go ahead. Bill Jaggers is wondering how difficult is it to change the blade on the Skyfe knife? Real easy. Ooh, real it's easy. Not, um, it's like changing blades on a broadhead. Just be careful when you're putting them in and so you don't slip. Um, they slide in a little channel and if you take something like a little tiny screwdriver, a little tip of a junk knife and flip them out and then put them in a safe blade disposal place, um, then the other one should slide right back in the channel. And unfortunately, um, these are all right-handed. Yes, yes. Um, they don't, that I know of, come left-handed. And um, I've seen people make them left-handed. <laughs> um, and they do work. It's, you could flip over this channel and you can rebend it. I've seen people do that and make them work. But uh, when they come, they're right-handed right yeah. too. Um, but... Um, we do have another tool similar that would work for a left-hander as well. Mm -hmm. Should I show them that one? Sure. Um, I can't remember what they call this guy. Is that a skyver? super skyver? Super, yeah. yep, super Good skyver. <laughs> and it's basically the same thing as the Skyfe knife. It's just another tool that's going to hold a single-edge razor blade. And um, this one, rather than being held sideways, is held straight, so you'll be able to pull straight back toward you and um, and shave with that. And it's like the Skyfe knife in that you have to have about the right texture, um, the right dryness to get really good results with it. Now, does that um, one have two is, sides to the blade? Can you turn the blade around? Um, same blade as a Skyfe knife. Oh, is it the same? Yep, okay. same as the Skyfe knife got blade it. on this one. I think the Helping Hands is the one that we've got the extra side to, um, which is another little tool that we could show them too. Uh, Donald Basta says, is it three ounces of citric acid a gallon of water? I know you went over this in an earlier video, but yeah, the it citric down. is yeah. three ounces per gallon. Yeah. And I think earlier if they if they're fact checking us their Facebook, <laughs> I think um, you mentioned 13 a in, in 20 and that is for formic so anybody that's keeping notes um uh, yeah, 13 we, for 20. we mix ours formic. with citric and that's three ounces per yep. gallon yeah and that looks like it's working real well um it is it is this one i would say is a little more aggressive than a skype knife so while the camera is on i'm being a little bit tentative with it but you can really make a uh, fast work of it and a nice place to um, work with this one is the base of the ears. Um, you can really thin that area that's hard to get with the machine um, and 
those of you that have thin capes and that show nice earbud earbud details, um, this is a great tool for working around that area. Now I'm just going to turn this this hide around. Sorry to move around so much on you, Kate. Um, you might have to zoom out just a little. There we go. There we go. I'm just going to move so you can see I've got the front that I just worked on. Now I flipped it over and I turned it on my beam so I, I have a nice flat surface to get on top of the nose and I can go over that as well. Now I'm going to go back to my handy dandy little Dexter knife because that's kind of my little tool of choice but um, and we can keep going on this and as Tom said we've got a long ways to go on this process but um, it's all all got to be done. Now the better you get with a machine the closer to these areas you can get and the less of this you have to do. Yes. But you've got to be brave. Um, and then uh, like your little wood wood bat there with your BMW on it. You've had that for years and years and years, years as long as I've years. ever known you. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of a tool or, but you need something to support that skin underneath. On the small areas, you can use your thumb and that works pretty good, but pretty soon your thumb gets kind of tired of doing that. It's nice to have a different variety of sticks and little support boards um, to do that. Some people use light bulbs, um, different supply companies make little um, fleshing, you know, things. I think we gave away a nice kit yep, last, last, time last time of little um, fleshing tools, and we do have some bigger ones. We've got one similar to, to this little beam. Um, we carry a bat, too, tapered end bat, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think. Um, all of those are really nice. Um, I think, although I'm not all the way done with the nose, um, someone had asked about the Dremel tool. Do, this feels like it'd be really good for I'll the Dremel. It. Do you want to show them? You go ahead. You've got it right um, there. Uh, we can do a little bit of that for a minute. And, and same thing, we're going to try to achieve the same results. And this is just a little sanding drum. On the Dremel, it's medium, maybe coarse. That one's probably medium. Coarse, coarse will go faster and dig deeper. And we're just going to go slow and work our way around. Um, the one thing with the Dremel is you want to make sure that the hide is fairly dry. Um, and this, it might be a little wet for this to be real effective. I'm going to turn it up just a little bit. Um, but you can continue detail fleshing. Once you get the majority of it off, you can go back over the surface and really fine tune with the Dremel. Um, do be aware of heat. I think they can heat this up and I'd be a little concerned about the epidermis with that too. Um, and that works pretty well to just get real nice and flat and smooth fleshing um, with the Dremel. Now I, I personally wouldn't use it for heavy, um, heavy meat like this area right here. Um, I think you'd have a lot of It'd take a lot of work to get through all of that. A couple of strokes with the knife would get that a little quicker, but the Dremel tool does leave you a real nice finish. Um, we kind of use it as a touch-up tool when yep. after you fleshed everything and you you think you about got it, but this will take it to the next level. Yeah, nice and smooth. So that's, that's another option too. Um, and you can get a little more coarse. I think this is just our little cuts all. Um, and that small diameter is going to be fairly aggressive, but um, you can see that'll do. It's just going to be a little more aggressive and do the same thing. Um, did you grab you, anything else? Did you want to show them this, what you're doing there? And Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Might be a little soon, um, but... Well, we've... The nostrils and nose detail on any animal is one of those little nuances that we spend a lot of time. Um, one of the details that you've always spent a lot of time selling to customers, Tom, it's something that you can use to set your work apart. Um, I know you have a good sales pitch for customers <laughs> that, that really does show it. When you go to all of this work, you want to spend time to make sure that you're getting credit for it. And 
um, you do a good job with that, making sure that the customer knows it. Um, one of the things that there's an awful lot of detail in, in the nose and in the nostrils, and you can spend, oh man, hours. If we thin all of this material nice and thin, um, we can get a lot of detail, but carving it into foam takes an awful lot of time. One side's so, real easy. To match it with the other side is near impossible. It really is. So um, we have a, an artificial nose that's, that is a mold from a real deer. Um, the surface of, of the skin has been removed from it. And all of the nostril, inner nostril detail is, is there. The septum is in place. All of this area that we're working on right now on the skin lays over this really nice and neat. And you can actually see these little tubes that we have here um, are what we will use to tuck into um, this nostril. And Kate, if you can get really close, I'm gonna show you right inside. Yep, perfect, perfect. Now if I can hold still. Um, you can see in that view, there's a little thin edge right here. And we're going to tuck our skin Great right up camera. against that edge. And the thinner our skin is, the better it's going to meet up to that edge. And if we get it nice and thin, there's so little finish work to do that um, it, there really isn't much to do in the very end. So we like to thin this in preparation for this nose. And to do that, we, we can get rid of a lot of this material because that edge isn't very far in there. So coming around to the bottom side, and it might look more like a nose to you if I show you this way. Um, probably making that tough on you to follow, aren't I, Kate? Um, there's our nostril, and I can tuck that out of the way, just like that. And you'll see here, if I push this back, we have all of this white, um, membrane right through here, kind of cream colored, I guess, um, on the bottom and on the top. And where we've put that little edge for you is right at the hairline. So if I were to remove any of this excess, I'm going to leave, oh, less than an eighth of an inch and remove all of that skin. Right there. That saves you a lot of fleshing. It does. It really does. Um, saves a lot of work and a lot of time. Now the top side up here, the upper part of the nostril, right here, we're going to leave that long. And the reason we're going to do that is because it will tuck into the detail of the artificial nose and up under and it'll disappear. You won't be able to see that edge. So we don't have an edge on the top side. We just flesh this nice and thin, leave it a little bit long and tuck it up under and you'll never see the edge. Um, we have the edge on the bottom side. So we'll have this top piece that we need to make nice and thin. We do have a little wing there that we need to split so it follows the, the contour of the inner nostril. But um, we'll just do that a little bit, and this will go right up in there. And this is just a, a mounting aid. I mean, it, it speeds up the work. It is a, um, I don't know, what are they, $16, $17 I think, yep, or so. Yep. Um, you save it up in time, but your symmetry between nostrils is oh, yeah. near perfect. Yep. And um, the accuracy and the septum that's in there. Otherwise, we always put septums in and... and carve out was, and use epoxy sculpt yeah. to shape our nostrils and this is so much Tremendous nicer and easier. Turning. Um, I'm going to cheat and I have a hide over here that's a little further along and I can show you maybe uh, quickly how that works. Um, this hide is actually the one we put in the pickle last week for you and this one is basically done. Um, we've done all of our fleshing um, the eye work that Tom showed you earlier, the nostril work, everything's nice and thin now. And so I can turn this forward for you like so. 
and go so far as to put this right up underneath. And we can show you how it lays in there. If everything's nice and thin, this just lays right in there just like that. That's without any tools. It is. We just mounted a deer nose. <laughs> it did, too. Um, just like that. So it's got a really nice look. Um, you know, we'll pack that with a, with a plastic after it's been glued up. And we do put just a little bit of clay on the surface here. You don't need very much. Um, be careful not to get it too, too much. Um, some people put too much clay on the front of the nose and then it gets stretched out and wide. But um, yeah, so that's how that works. If it's nice and thin, um, that's how that artificial nose was designed. And that's why we do this part of it. That's an excellent, this excellent part of it. product. Um, even if you get one just for reference, the reference, yeah. that, yep. like Brett said, that was made from a real deer nose, um, yep. molded, and then carefully, carefully reworked to make it perfect, and then production mold. And yep. um, that's a great reference. If you're going to carve out your own nostrils out of your foam, follow that, and yep. that's what you're shooting for. It works out really, really well. Um, we remold those almost as much as we do bird heads, don't we? You make hundreds <laughs> we and hundreds. Make a lot of them. Um, and you have them in a uh, medium and a large white tail. Yeah. Uh, Brian Olson Brian has does. large and medium. Um, I think we call them a medium and a small. Medium and a small mule yeah. deer. And yeah. we have an antelope. Yep. And we now have an antelope. And we just found out that the antelope is close enough to work with an impala. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we just did two beautiful impala with <laughs> and it the antelope nose. It worked pretty good. A little bit of alteration, but um, it worked pretty well. So should we, you want to go over this with them and kind of show, recap what we were starting to show them there? Um, or is that too far? No, let me see. Uh, just feeling this, just as you were working with it, I already know what it feels like because I've handled so many um, well-fleshed hides. But compared to this one, which is started nothing mm -hmm. more than started this leather feels thick yeah um this feels like fine linen i mean this is like very 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 nice and thin um you did the lips on this now this lip skin you want very thin and uh we use a like a drill bit for our lip slot and what mm -hmm. size drill bit it's it's almost, less than a 16th. Yeah, it's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little drill bit. Some people use tools and they will punch in their mm -hmm. lip slot. Um, we like to do it with something a little bit, little bit neater, but a tool will work. Some mm -hmm. people use nothing more than a knife blade and just follow their form line around. Yeah. That, that does work. Want it very thin. And like uh, you said, when I started on the eyes, about a quarter on the lips too, maybe. I like a, a little bit not very much material for some reason in my head the less material the less there is to shrink yes and the and the more that you have um the more you have to cram into a little yep. little cut and then you start parting things and making things do go places they don't want to go yeah. um, the nice part about this is you're not going to have any or minimal 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 stretch this is not going to shrink Bad. Yeah. Um, another thing I would like to emphasize, and you did it really well on here, is this area, and you got this on the machine, oh, yeah. and you can see the part that's not machined, you know, with the uh, dirty, yeah. dirty leather on there, fresh off the animal. <clears throat> this has been fleshed very, very thin, and that is your ear butt, and I can just put my fingers in here and I can stretch it and it wants to get real big. I can stretch it this way. It's very maneuverable, very, very supple and movable. Um, this is important because we build our ear, our ear butts out of clay, or you can buy ears with ear butts on them. Mm -hmm. But if this is too thick, they don't fit. You're adding too much leather over an ear butt. It's going to make your ear butts too big. You can't taxi the skin. Um, so as you're fleshing and you get this all very, very thin, don't forget about this ear butt tube. It's really important to get that thin. And then the other thing I mentioned is you want, it, you want this to be um, real thin around the seam so you can sew. There's a couple places here I would probably touch up, but look yeah. at how thin 
around that antler burr. That is paper thin around that antler burr. Um, that paper thin skin is going to pull up to the leather antler burr real well. The glue that we use is going to hold it in place and it's not going to shrink and I'm not going to have to have a whole bunch of head capes laying around <laughs> that I have to cut a little bit of wedge out yeah. and hot glue them into position. <laughs> I did that for my first 50 deer, I bet, <laughs> and couldn't figure out how come they're always shrinking like that. Yeah, and um, I didn't realize I probably set my antlers back an <laughs> inch farther than what they were supposed to be too. But um, tear ducts, this is another thing. Your little tear duct, you want this thin, really, really thin, and stick a little um, bat, like the end of a bat, <laughs> or one of your sticks or your finger and make sure that with a scythe knife or a scalpel or a knife you thin all of that 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 tear duct is actually kind of a sack that gets tucked way up in make sure that you flesh all around that sack and that it is as thin as possible if you cut a hole in it um, it's not gonna have to be fixed because it's tucked way up into your ear yeah. cut your ear slot cut or I'm sorry, your tear duct cut. So make sure you get all those little details. When we mount a deer, um, what would you say, what would you say if the deer is mounted as good and fleshed as good as we could, mounted well, what's your finish work time that you invest in it? Oh gosh, most of it's probably um, texture in the end of the nose yep. um, because that's, we have to rebuild that, but it shouldn't be more than a couple hours at the very most from um, start to finish yeah and that's that's pretty fast now if you have to build up nostril you know inside the nostrils yeah. um that takes time if you have a big old crack around the eye that's going to take you 15 minutes oh, yeah. an eye um, if you have drumming you're probably going to have to inject it you're going to have to rehydrate the skin squirt some glue in there put it back down um, now it's already too thick, you know, anyway, it's probably going to drum yeah. again. Um, a lot, you know, there's just so much that you you can save yourself a whole lot of headaches right now by getting this yeah. thinner and thinner and thinner. So, um, this one, next week we'll probably show them how to tan. Um, maybe maybe do a little bit of sewing, show them how oh, to yeah, fix we gotta repair. repair. Sorry. Um, um, we're going to repair a hole or two there that Ooh, we've got I'll let to let you show them that one. <laughs> um, this is them. a big, um, this is a big hole. And like we said, when these deer come in, make sure that you check that out in front of the customer, let him see it because what you're going to do is you're going to fix it. And if it doesn't fix perfectly, you don't want him saying, Hey, what happened there? You know, um, yeah. I would always leave my customer with a little bit of doubt. I will do the best I can. You know, we, I think we can camouflage it pretty good, but there may be a blem there. Yeah. Um, just leave it at that. And then when you do a really good job of fixing it, they're going to think you're like magic. <laughs> uh, but this one, just to show you, I don't know if you can see, we've got good hair down here, but when the, I think this is maybe a muzzle loader or something, when yeah. it went in, it cut and burnt all of this hair right here. So that all has to be removed. So this hole, which is the size of a small ping pong ball, it's gonna be about the size of an orange, it's you know, or a, a big, big egg. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that all has to be taken out and it all has to be put back together. And you run into all kinds of situations where upstream from the damage, you have longer hair or shorter hair and downstream from the damage, you have longer hair yeah. and a lot can um, go wrong and fix it. So we will spend maybe most of next week doing fix it yeah. and uh, then we can maybe see how far we get and start the tanning process. Neutralize and tan. Yeah. So they should all, I think it, the moral of the story is there's a lot to this tanning stuff. <laughs> Four episodes in and we're, we're getting there. And uh, so that's what we're going to do next week and have a real happy Easter. Oh, yeah. Um, and we have a giveaway. We're going to give you a Skype night today. Is that right? Yes. And the winner for this week's giveaway goes to Sarah DeJournet. What's with these oh. women? Didn't the lady win it last week too? <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Um, congratulations, women. Sarah. Right. Um, if you like fine finish fleshing, this is a great tool to have. Yep. Yep. 
Make sure to like and share this video to be entered into next week's live video. Thank you very much. And